the, the culprit here is that not everybody gets tested when they have a food poisoning. They just go, oh, I had a stomach bug. Oh, and it's self-limiting. So our body knows how to heal from this. And even say, for example, constipation folks kind of almost celebrate a loose stool. You know, they'll be like, oh, thank goodness. I got this stuff out of me. Yeah. And they don't really, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll chalk it up to that. Like, oh, you mean the time I actually got it out? And I'm like, yeah, well, that's part of your history now. everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of the Sleep Like a Boss podcast. I'm Anika Carroll, your host. And today I have a very special guest. It's Dr. Melanie Keller. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. And we're going to talk one of my favorite topics when it comes to sleep, and that is gut. And we're going to dive into something very specific that we haven't talked about on the show at all. And that is IBS and SIBO. And that is your area of expertise. And I'm super excited because you have an astonishing success rate working with your patients and clients on this because SIBO specifically isn't always that easy. People who have suffered from it might have tried things and have seen that it can be a long journey and it can be not so successful sometimes. And we'll go into all that. And um, yeah, you have, I think with your approach, um, you've been so successful. You've been in Forbes Health. You've been on ABC. You've been um, getting publicity with what you're doing, which is amazing. And I'm so happy to have you here. And maybe we just start with why IBS and SIBO? Why, why is that your thing? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, those who have generally studied, <laughs> I mean, in some case or another, right? Either the doctor themselves or their family member, they've been exposed to it. Um, and then they find themselves in that line of work or it's been passed down through their family. Um, my fam my father was a proctologist. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Mine was not. <laughs> but, you know, like, how do you get into that line of work? For me, I, I was the sufferer. I was the, um, we can't figure out what's wrong with you, i.e. the diagnosis of IBS, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, they still don't know, although they should be up to date, uh, literally, of what is, and that's what I'm excited to share here. But yeah, I, I grew up in Southeast Alaska on a pristine lifestyle with mountain water, you know, getting the jug from the, <clears throat> from the spring. I was in a commercial fishing family, so I had salmon up to my eyeballs. Um, I was the granola crunchy family that, you know, that ordered from the co-op. And yet I struggled with my health. I was not a reflection of that. And, um, and I think that weighed on my energy, on my family's energy, because it, it was like, what's going on here? And the main thing was, was um, I suffered from horrible constipation. And I also I often talk about like, when do we stop talking about our diapers? Because it's really essential at the beginning of life. And then it usually comes up at the end of life. But where and at what time, depending on the family, do you stop talking about it? And mm -hmm. so I was about 16 years old when my mom was asking me how my function was. And I, of course, was the really stubborn, embarrassed teenager going, oh, mom, like, you know, like we don't talk about that, None of your business. but it had been, I was like, I don't know, like a month ago and she just lost it. Her face was about like that. And we were in this small town. She gets on the phone and she calls the local herbal, you know, natural food store in Juneau. It had to be flown up on a little plane. That's how like she was like, we're handling this now. Like there wasn't a trip to Juno. It was, we're flying this up. And it was herbs and fiber and all the things that actually have come up in my naturopathic training, yet it didn't do anything. And in fact, even my mom, you know, lovingly a little helicoptering around me was like, what's going on? What's going on? And I was like, this is making things worse. And here you are a teenager and you're not understood and nobody understands. And she just spent how much money on, you know, and it's like, well, and I'm like, yeah, I feel the same way. I'm walking, I'm doing the water, I'm doing all of the things. What else you got? 
And when you go through that for so many years, and then you're also going through puberty and hormonal changes and emotions and all these things, it can be really, really, really frustrating as some people already know and can relate to this. And then of course, there's also the factor of being female. And so in the conventional model, they're like, well, of course, yeah, okay. And, or this is in your head or you're these chromosomes and we see this, um, yet they don't connect as many dots as we can now, or, and unfortunately not many people do, uh, I'll be honest with you, it is still semi-archaic in conventional medicine. And it's still a bit assumption based in functional and naturopathic medicine. Yes. And it, but it is such a thing. Eh? And like, if we talk about, if we talk about con like constipation alone, because I was one of those, and I did not know that, like, that was like four weeks was not a thing for me, but like this, the idea of having daily bowel movements was like far from anything I was ever for the first 28, 29 years of my life. Well, I don't know when I was a baby, but like, right, mm -hmm. most of you have diapers. Probably, like, no. And it's like, that never occurred to me that that was a problem because you Google and Google says two to three bowel movements a week is totally fine. Even one every two weeks is okay. I'm like, oh, okay, so nothing to worry about. Oh, well, thank and, you, Google. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Google. And then things kind of get worse and then you start wondering, but you only start wondering because Google still says it's... Uh, it's still fine. Like it, right. It's, it's just weird. So how did you then, how did you resolve this for yourself? Well, I was in naturopathic medical school and again, learning all these things and herbs and more flax and more of this. And it was kind of like the same stuff. And I was like, wait a minute, I came here, you know, I came here for something new and I would, I'd raise my hand and I'd say, what if that doesn't work? What are the, and cause I was this person. And I was like, I am doing all the things, people. And my uh, mentor happened to be uh, away at the time uh, writing his book. So he actually came back um, while I was in school. And, and it was a big announcement about him writing his book, Functional Gastroenterology. And so I just devoured that book. And there was a page on, that had about two paragraphs about small intestine bacterial overgrowth. Mm-hmm. And I thought, I mean, it just instantly made sense to me, but we also had a graduate who was coming back and kind of around to the clinic more, who was also focused on this and had a similar situation where she read this and she was like, this is what I have. They started meeting and, you know, and it was just, it was under my radar. Like I was under my observation. And when it came time for doing my internship, I applied for uh, shadowing for a proctorship with him and um and I I won the lottery and I was able to not only do that term with him but I stayed with him and I even stayed with him post graduation as like a pseudo resident mm -hmm. um but even while I was in school it was still new everyone respects him right but yet when I was on say for example an herbal shift and I recommended a breath test and I was told, oh, no, 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 you are on an herbal shift. You will come up with an herbal remedy. And I said, of course I will do that. But I would like this test first to see what gases are present. And then I will make my herbal remedy accordingly. And this woman, she was quite fiery, quite spicy. And it just so happened, I'm like chasing, you know, like walking behind her, that little like, you know, the, the students behind. And we happened to cross paths with him in the hallway. And she stops him and she even's like, hey, <laughs> she wants to do this. And he said, yeah, I support her completely. I mean, it was kind of one of those, ooh. And she then was like, okay, fine. You know, and I was like, great, thank you. But like, I came from that. I came from advocating, not only in school, but also for patients and, and then helped build the um, the center at our university and and, you know, was helping the lab with recalibrating the machines. And, you know, it was just there for all of it. And knowing that it was innovative and new and just an answer for some, for many people, including myself, I was very much immersed in it. We had weekly meetings. We have had multiple symposiums. I've seen thousands of breath tests and I was there to be at the table and also share and say, that doesn't work for me. 
that has not helped my constipation. And I generally had the other opinion and it took a lot of, you know, <laughs> gusto yeah. to, to, uh, to even say that amongst my peers. And I was the new grad and I, you know, was like, hang on a second. I think there's something to saturated fat and methane. What do you know? That comes out in research. You know, I have an opinion about probiotics. I mean, there's a lot of things that unfolded that by having that alternative opinion or that wider scope that helped me get results. Cause I was like, you know, it was like daily bowel movements that that happens in other people's lives or that's some dream world that, you know, and yeah, going from that'll be the day to that's what happens daily. It is possible. And I'd like somebody right now to know that I can feel that there is a person who just needs to know that it is possible and that you will continue to advocate for yourself to get these results. Awesome. And tell us a little bit, how do you, how do you define IBS? Because before we hit record, we had a bit of a discussion. There are people who, I think there sometimes are a little bit different definitions of that in, in mm -hmm. the world out there. And what is SIBO? Do they okay. differentiate? Are they linked? How do you see? Yeah, that? they are a lovely little Venn diagram that we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about here. Um, so irritable bowel syndrome is often a functional gastroenterology um, condition. And what we mean by that is that they have run all of the, say, major testing to see if it's not something more serious, generally looking for inflammatory bowel disease, which is autoimmune it can be destructive. We know that about celiac. We know that about ulcerative colitis, if we just listen to these words. And yet at the same time, there it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So we often will see like a 20 something who's had a colonoscopy. And when you're amongst the circles of gastros who, who deeply care about this, I will say, they'll say, it is really shocking to see a system that has run a 23 year old through three colonoscopies. And I, I want to be mindful and, and professionally respectful of, of, we do need our specialists, but oftentimes they are in these systems. They're in these algorithms there. They have this pressure to order certain, you know, order procedures that are profitable for the, the hospital there. I said it. And if you do not have something that is worthy of further workup or you've had the colonoscopy and they found, quote, nothing wrong with you, that's often what people are told, then they're handed, and as we discussed, the pamphlet, or they're handed off to the psychiatric uh, yeah. department, or they're, mm, here you go, let me pass you on to a registered dietitian. Uh, because we don't really know, I, it's it's not on me to have to go any further. I'm speaking from that specialist perspective. So you know what, hands off. I know you're telling me what you're you know going through, but I can't really deal with it. Nor do I want to. I agree, and that we talked about that before we recorded. That was my experience. I had an issue. Went to the GI specialist. They did a biopsy. They didn't even look at my gut. They only looked at my stomach. And then he was like, I can't, I can't help you. There's nothing wrong there. Um, literally, here's the pamphlet. And what did, did it outline? It's a disease of the nervous system. And what helps people? Yes, be careful with your diet and go see a therapist. Yes. And now <laughs> we know, quite frankly, this is what I mean by the gold standard is since 2018, is that there is a blood test. And there is a specific blood test that they have calibrated so fine tuned that there's no way you could, it could be that you have an uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So this is a simple test that practitioners could and should be doing to then capture an antibody. So this is an autoimmune response to the reason why people have 
Now, the evidence is, is clear for diarrheal and diarrheal with mixed. So some people can have a mixed stool presentation. We call this mm -hmm. IBS mixed. Mm -hmm. This hasn't been validated for constipation. So I'm going to say that in terms of the research and, and respecting the, the this team that are incredible, that have been dedicated for years to show that this is not in your head, that they do hear you. They are lovely people. And yet at the same time, I like to test everyone because I see outside the bell curve, right? And I practice rogue medicine in, in the sense that I get to do what I want outside of insurance uh, codes and things. And my point being there is that we now know with certainty that if you've had a bacterial food poisoning, that this can lead to an autoimmune response to the toxin left behind by that bacteria. And of course, that's one of my questions. Have you had a food poisoning? Not everybody remembers, or they'll say, well, my so-and-so who also went to the barbecue didn't have a problem. And I'll say, yes, agreed. A hundred of us can go to the wedding and have the salmonella chicken. And only 10 of us will have this autoimmune response. And hence around three, 21 days to maybe three months later is when these IBS symptoms start. And they could be mild, they could be extreme. I've seen people in excruciating pain in and out of emergency rooms and again told that there's nothing wrong with them. Now that's that's the challenge, right? That can weigh on your emotion, that can affect your sleep clearly, right? So, and not all food poisoning is bacterial. So we can have a viral gastroenteritis. And um, I will say there was a particular fast food chain, I won't name them, that was going through some challenges for a few years. I happened to have been at Cedar sinai with a research team at a time when there was an outbreak from this chain and they just lit up and they were telling everybody, they were telling the ER, you know, they were telling all departments, if this comes in, please send them to us so that we can do this testing. And in the end, that was a viral case, not bacterial. The, the culprit here is that not everybody gets tested when they have a food poisoning. They just go, oh, I had a stomach bug. Oh, and it's self-limiting. So our body knows how to heal from this. And even say, for example, constipation folks kind of almost celebrate a loose stool. You know, they'll be like, oh, thank goodness. I got this stuff out of me. Yeah. And they don't really, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll chalk it up to that, like, oh, you mean the time I actually got it out? And I'm like, yeah, well, that's part of your history now. And so that's really important. And like on my intake, I'll ask people where they've traveled, if they've done their own fermenting of their foods. Um, I've had some funkity funk on the top of my <laughs> sauerkraut experiments, you know, where I just go, oh, let's just take that upper leaf off. Well, what was I really ingesting? Yeah. You know, how many 24 hour yogurts, you know, there's just, there's a lot there. Okay. So from IBS, reduced. what symptoms would we be, but what would we be presenting with? Mainly we're going to see diarrhea. Okay. Abdominal pain, capital letters, bold bloating, mm -hmm. cramping. Mm -hmm. um, those are, and then constipation. So those are the, those are the main symptoms. And sometimes not everybody maybe wants to share, but I directly ask, they'll have very fragrant or a lot of wind, flatulence, whatever the spectrum is. Cause I'll mm -hmm. say, so are you gassy? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm like, is it fragrant? And they'll kind of look at me like, you'll get these faces of like fragrant <laughs> beep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> or other times that people be like, no, you know, that's just, it's just the wind. It's just the air, right. Escaping our bodies. But it can also have that, like, I don't know what's going to come out. So some people will have this transient. And that's a, often an indicator of hydrogen sulfide. Mm -hmm. So we have these particular microbes that are, are contributing to this situation. So when we've had this food poisoning that can trigger this autoimmune response, it actually affects our gut motility. And it's at phase three of our gut motility. So motility of our stomach starts in our stomach. That's phase one. Then we have phase two, which is this main area of the small intestine where all the good stuff is happening. We're digesting our nutrients. We are creating neurotransmitters for our mood and regulation. And then there's this phase three, 
where if we've had this food poisoning trigger where our immune system recognizes that toxin, it can have this autoimmune response to, I call it the little light switch. It's a motor complex nerve called vinculin. And if that is triggered, then you'll have an elevation in antibodies. And I refer to this as having a skip in the record. Mm -hmm. So somebody can have lower antibodies, so it can come up as if it, you know, registers on the blood test, but it's just like a little scratch, you know, it might kind of make the album sound cool versus a groove in the record is going to be that thing that, right, the song keeps skipping and you have to get up and actually move the needle. So hence those who have the higher antibody and are deemed positive for this, then they might have more symptoms. They might have more of a relapse potential. They might have more quote unquote rules, i.e. the diet, the FODMAT, like all of these things that they hear about how to treat this because they have a skip in the re record at phase three. So we now know that IBS is 60 to 80%, depending on the study, and this is worldwide, SIBO. So when we're looking at that Venn diagram, mm -hmm. You have, yes, you have some people who might find something in their workup that is a functional dysfunction of their system. There might be um, an, the skip in the record, and then there can also be this bacterial overgrowth. And all those combined can then be the reasoning for having the gut problems. Which makes it individual. I think, and it makes it complex, right? Potentially. Potentially, yeah. Because again, people in my community, they'll say, oh, autoimmune, I'm gonna do this autoimmune protocol. Do what you would like, professional courtesy and respect. However, my people don't need to do any of that. Um, people say, oh, they have a skip in the record in their motility. They're going to need to stimulate their vagus nerve. They're gonna to need to gargle three hours a day. They're going to, you know, and the list goes on and on where the person's exhausted uh, by what they have. Whereas I'm here to say, yeah, I've seen the highest antibody level yet to date. And this gentleman doesn't have to do anything in particular. He's not even on a motility agent, a prokinetic, as people will refer to it as. And so is it, so this antibody, Tell me a little bit about this, anybody, and why I'm so curious about that. And we haven't even gotten to sleep yet. You're yeah. like the person I wish I would have met like eight <laughs> years ago, because I think this is because this is exactly what happened. I got, yes. but I was tanked already. My system was fragile for sure. I got food poisoning. My husband did too. We ate at the same place, ah. and I never recovered from it. He was down a day. And I dealt with it for a month was exactly those. I was six months pregnant every night yep. with bloat. It was gone in the morning. Okay. Nobody listened. Like the GI specialist basically gave me the pamphlet after he said, I don't have H. pylori because that is what he thought, what he was looking for. Mm -hmm. And then I started self experimenting with things like probiotics, which was the, like I was in pain it was not good. And I stopped eat, like I stopped eating. I basically ate but literally bananas and oatmeal for months on end until I found somebody who could help me because that was the only thing where I could like somehow, somehow make it to the day through the day and get to work yeah. and function. It was yeah. insane. I wish I would have had you. Yeah, like, no. <laughs> yeah, no. I, and it's so sad to hear that. I hear that so often. They're like, these are the five foods. And so I'm not going to hand them a, here you go, here's your SIBO diet. No, no, I'm going to say, go with what you know, and then bring things in, at, you know, they could look at it as a guideline or often they're coming to me going, well, I'm on this and I've done that. And I've, they've almost overly reduced, you know, mm -hmm. and, and they're so knowledgeable and they're so proactive that, I mean, some of it's borderline orthorexia. Yeah, where I am then saying, please, please bring in these things, even if it's a small bite, even if it's just a tablespoon of rice or oats or whatever it is, whether whatever you've heard about grains and all of these things, like just try and start fresh. And it's it was fascinating to me, especially the people on limited foods that would come back for their follow up, and then they're on twenty, thirty food. You know, they're just like, oh, I, I, you know, I, I had my grandmother's casserole. I did this. I did that. This is in season, and I tried it, and I was okay. 
And yeah, that's what I'm here to say is that it doesn't have to be an, a forever thing, you know, that's what I'll hear the most. Can I ever have onions again? I'm like, yes, please. Or, you know, especially if it's that restrictive and they are embarrassed to ask the chef or their, their partner is like, when can we add the yeah. Trinity back into yeah. our lives? You know? Um, so yeah, no, that's, uh, apologize if I didn't get to answer the question there. I want to get back to to the end. So if we're saying, yeah, so let's do the antibody first. So it could okay. very well be that in that case where we had exactly the thing, the one partner kind of gets it over and done with and the other partner struggle with it forever, that yeah. that is something where there is, resi there is residual toxin in the body and the body just constantly fights it and attacks itself. Yeah, it, it has that autoimmune, that cross mim molecular mimicry with yeah. vinculin, that motor complex mm -hmm. nerve. And this auto, auto antibody can remain elevated between five and 10 years. Wow. So this is the person that's also susceptible to yet another food poisoning, right? Um, and so if we look at it over, right, how many times, how many things has this happened? How many trips have they gone on? You know, it can just compound um, and we only measure, we retest around once a year. And again, I'm here to say, I don't do any specific autoimmune protocols, but that's because I'm addressing the underlying cause and, and other things in that individual and looking at their individuality through epigenetics, because there can be other reasonings. Like for myself, I discovered I have some genetic pathways and enzymes that needed support and needed mm -hmm. specific support that when I add that in, then again, I reduce my, my other rules, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. by addressing my epigenetics, I didn't have to monitor every single thing I ate because the, it wasn't the underlying cause was cause was not eating yeah. asparagus. Yes. <laughs> the underlying cause was how my body actually functions and the ingredients that it needs. I'm just going to ask one quick question about these berries, and then I'm going to go to small bacteria over it. Okay. There is a funny phenomenon in people talking about asparagus specifically. I think it's not so bad with green, but it is with white. And being from Europe, like there's a lot of white asparagus over the summer. There are people whose urine smells like so, like smells yeah. after they eat it immediately. And there are people who don't have this. Is this a thing like, do some people not smell it? Or is it processed differently in the body? And this could potentially also be linked to what we're talking about, gut issues and things. Um, I think it's a good example of an epigenetic, you know, it's a, some do, some don't, right? Some have dimples, some have cowlick, some people don't process asparagus properly. And I think you might be going to the sulfur component. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. So that is, I would separate them because I've also worked with people who are like, I have hydrogen sulfide, so I have to remove all the sulfur from my life. And I'm like, no, we need sulfur, just exactly. like histamine. Yeah. People who completely remove histamine, I'm like, we need histamine, folks. This helps your stomach acid. Yes. <laughs> and like, good fertility. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and then that will lead me to telling people about stomach acid, because there is a huge assumption, again, speaking, I was taught this in medical school to assume, and I'm just going to be a little playful here, that everybody has low stomach acid. If you're past a certain age, you, oh, you have gut problems. Oh, you must have gut, you know, low stomach acid. You might even hear this from your yoga teacher. And I'm here to say that is also not the case. And it came from the researchers of this condition ha happened to say to myself and a group of naturopaths that said, you know, I'd be really careful giving betaine HCL, especially to your uh, methane patients. And it struck me because I literally had just come from the clinic. I had just given my patients some betaine HCL. I probably was on betaine HCL myself. I will, I am here to say for those of you who say that changed my life great because you then might be, I'll explain my point for those who have said it didn't do anything to me. I'd say, yep, I completely understand. And for those who it made worse, I'm again here to explain that because that was my case. 
And here's what he said. He says it's HCl. So it's a hydrochloric acid. And if you are giving that person betaine HCl and you're raising up the capsules, right, which is another thing, keep going until you feel yeah. the burn, which yeah. is another thing that I feel can be dangerous, folks, for some of you. Please hear that. <laughs> Um, but what he was saying is you're contributing this hydrogen. Now, methane likes four hydrogen. Hydrogen sulfide, which is technically our diarrheal component. Many people will equate hydrogen as that as diarrhea. Yes, that is true, but it's hydrogen is actually a fuel source for methane likes four and hydrogen sulfide likes five. So they are battling it out for these Pac-Man pellets is what I like to say. So either you have a stomach that in and of itself is producing a faster rate of hydrochloric acid, i.e. hyperchlorhydria, and so your stomach is, is its own Pac-Man pellet factory. And to your point of many gastros and even in our world will say, oh, well, I looked for H. pylori, and I have asked the research team this a number of times. I've said, if we know that that bacteria can be acid resistant, why haven't we looked for another one? Now, methane is not technically a bacteria. It is actually an archaea, which means it just is more ancient than bacteria. All right. They, they are in a family, but they are different. And I have actually just kind of asked, and I'll be that annoying when are we going to check for this? Because if we have acknowledged that H. pylori can do what it does, it's my theory, theory only, that we have a problem with methane being acid resistant and we could actually even be having an overgrowth or an overproduction in the stomach. And I'll often get a, you're onto something, we just haven't gotten there yet. Because where does the money need to go and where is the research headed? Okay, so I took that on and decided from that moment from this comment that I was going to test everyone that came into my office that I explained this to. And thankfully, I had very trusting people who said, yeah, let's do this. And it is a Heidelberg pH test. And mm -hmm. it'll get a lot of eye rolls from specialists because they've got newer, fancier, smart pills and all the things. And I'll say, yep, we're going old school with this radio frequency capsule, please. And I'll just give some statistics based out of the over 100 um, cases that I've done. But with the 100, I found five people who technically their stomach was slow to reacidify, i.e. hypochlorhydria or low stomach acid. So out of 100, out of all of the people specifically coming to me for this problem, there were five. And when they were given betaine HCL, their lives changed immediately and so quickly and so profoundly that I was like, oh, I understand the premise of why people can be so passionate about low stomach acid. So hope there, everybody can hear that. I have seen, I've seen people who had lost so much weight that they were being worked up for cancer and for all of these very serious conditions. And as soon as we got their stomach acid in the right place, they were they were very easily able to add in all kinds of you know foods back in because none of them really wanted to even restrict their food in the first place. And they successfully regained weight, quite frankly, very quickly. Um, I had one gentleman came to me, six, 135 pounds, and he was a hypochlorhydric case. And within two months, he'd get put on 25 pounds. He went from carrying his bone broth on private jets to becoming a foodie and saying, I'm, you know, visiting my family. I'm going to have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And I was like, fantastic. And he's like, gluten. I said, go for it. <laughs> and he's now a proclaimed foodie, right? So that's the that's the level of change. It's not kind of sort of, it is profound. Then there were five people who came back with normochlorhydria. They were within the range. And those are the people that you gave the antibiotics, herbals, or even a diet because the diet does not technically treat the condition. It can give you symptom relief. Um, and they are, they, they, they have the hallelujah music, right? They're just like, oh, and they're like, great, I'm good. Is this over? Thank you very much. I'll 
see you hopefully never, although they generally come back for, <laughs> for other things. And then there was this 90% of people who had this high acid production. It was faster on this test. And so there were these Pac-Man people. And I will say there's probably a handful of people who have had a history of reflux out of those 90, let's say five to 10. Yeah, I've had a little reflux here and there, or they have a history of saying, my gastroenterologist gave me a proton pump inhibitor. And again, they are well Googled and they've heard through the Facebook groups that proton pump inhibitor causes SIBO. I'm here to say that has been confirmed by plenty of studies that that is not true. Now, do I agree with suppressing that, that stomach acid production by a proton pump inhibition? If it's necessary, yes. But if it's not necessary and it's the first thing that somebody's been given, then I'll investigate it further to say perhaps this is a transient problem before and or after meals, which is partly how I work with people on the individual level. But in adjusting their pH in the stomach, whether it was low or high acid production, this completely changed everything. And in fact, I was asking people at this time to not do anything else. I was asking them, can we please do this instead of herbals, antibiotics, instead of a diet? I'd like you to just eat what you would like to eat. And this is the only variable. And to see the transformation and even have breath test companies owner call me up and go, so what was the, you know, was this cinnamon? Was this, this, was this that? And I was like, no, this was nothing. This was, or, you know, this was simply addressing pH of the stomach and, and having people come back from a breath test where they had just finished a round of antibiotics and their breath test hadn't even moved, didn't even budge to then coming to me and I, we address the stomach within two weeks, they have a negative breath test. So it was by way of this that I've actually gotten to, you know, gotten to know some gastroenterologists, gotten to know some people by, you know, cause it's a small world in LA and people might see multiple people and then they'll come back and be like, how'd you get that negative breath? <laughs> breath test with that really challenging case. And I'm like, well, would you like to know? Cause I'd love to share. Um, it's just up to whether that practitioner is open, we'll say so oftentimes. <laughs> and so let's talk about small intestinal bacterial over. So mm -hmm. does SIBO, uh, does IBS then, and the, the, not the constipation, the gut not moving, digested material properly. Is mm -hmm. that what causes small intestinal bacteria overgrowth or is it the not enough stomach acid that comes in from the top to kill bacteria and lets bacteria through? Is it, is it a two way street? Like, is it back up or is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like, I'll give my analogy about it. Cause I grew up in Alaska and you're a fishing family. You're out there with the, trying to get the fish, right. But where do the fish come from upstream? Mm -hmm. Right. So you have to go to where they're spawning and where, what the health is of the salmon's life, right? So I looked at the phases of gut motility. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, a, is a, a word that I'd like to clarify also for people, because those with diarrhea will say, don't stimulate my gut motility. Oof, I got plenty of that. And I'm here to say, actually, this is a separate compartment. This, you want gut motility. You want optimized gut motility. And that, it, the motility is from our stomach, phase one. It goes through our small bowel. And then it goes through to phase three, where they're looking at the end part, where the skip in the record could be. So I decided to go upstream and say, well, if the problem starts here in the stomach and our prokinetic agents, because I was the patient, I was ordering a particular drug for $2.54 a day that did absolutely nothing for me. I was on so much ginger. I was doing, again, I'll just say I was doing all of the things and that was not working for me. So I said, what could this Goldilocks pH be that then physiology, just going all the way back to basics and saying, oh, well, it's a pH component. Now, I also was raised in a family of dentistry. And so pH was always a subject 
<laughs> if they saw me drinking my mineral water, they'd be like, Ooh, do you know what that's doing to your mouth? When they saw apple cider vinegar in drinks in our bookstore and, you know, students walking around drinking these drinks the whole day, they were just like, they couldn't even believe it. They were just like, what is going to happen to those people's mouths? And hence when we are, you know, so really digestion begins in the mouth as we know, and in our brain. And, and so I was like, okay, if I can get them to think, if we can do food hygiene, if we can get people to be relaxed and smell their food and chew and, you know, so we do need to start there, but I was really looking at this gut motility component and, and why there was, you know, why were people needing to be on a specific drug? Because also at the time I was this pioneer of call, having to call the pharmacy all the time as to why we were doing low dose erythromycin. And I had to correct and always say, yes, they can cut this, please allow them to get this drug. Right. So there was that history there that I was thinking, what else can we be doing? Um, because also a low dose erythromycin could be doing other things to us long-term. And this was before we had other, uh, at least the other option now that's working at the serotonin level. So when we look at how phase one is, then phase two is where the, I call it the lint and the dryer vent happens, right? So this is where things get to be overgrown because we, these are good bacteria. This is not an infection. These guys are our friends when they get moved along and put into the large intestine. It's when they get stuck, yes, because of that skip, that that then causes a problem. Now, to, be, to discern the difference between diarrheal and constipation, we are specifically saying small intestine bacterial overgrowth, because as we say, they're our friends in the large intestine. Whereas a new nomenclature that's been around a while now for those of us who have been studying this, it's called intestinal methane overgrowth. This means that it can be throughout the entire tube. So mm -hmm. methane is a culprit in not just the small bowel, but also in the large bowel. So that can be a discern discernment that they are now making saying, oh, okay, this is methane and we can handle methane differently. Um, and yet the problem lies in this motility aspect. Now, motility is happening between meals. So having complete kind of ending of meals and not snacking. Technically, this means no calories. So no coffee, no tea, no gum, no snacking between from the time our stomach has emptied. It's about two hours that we want to have this nice time frame to allow this migrating motor complex or cleaning waves to happen. And so that is essential. And, you know, not everybody does that. Some people will overdo it. They'll read the study and they'll be like, oh, but it's between four hours and, you know, and three and a half or three and a quarter. And they're like literally watching the clock because they're so hungry or they're having blood sugar dysregulation. And I would actually say, come on, let's, let's, let's give that a little bit of a break. Right. Especially that now that we have the blood test, we can be more specific to the, to that individual. So I hope that that helps in terms of what we're doing, where motility is important and it's most active at night when we sleep. So that's the really a big thing that I wanted to express yeah. to people is that it's in between these meals, but then also at night is when this cleaning wave is doing our best action, getting all of that small bacterial into the large bowel where it is then our friend. Yes. And is, so what about, so if people struggle with sleep is something like, because you talked about snacking. So snacking late at night. Am I hearing for that clientele specifically also if there is a risk of IBS, SIBO, not a good idea? Um, again, it can really depend on the person um, because, it, you know, some people do do well with like a protein um, snack. Let's say, again, we just have to be mindful of, of people's situations. I think it's the fact that they, if they haven't been tested, if they don't know, if they have this history and, or they have this bloating that goes on throughout the day, I hear this from men and women, men saying they feel nine months pregnant. Um, not all people have that visible distension. Some people mm -hmm. just feel like they are a water balloon. 
um, let's say. And so then I, I would say they may, or maybe they even have a practitioner who has them on a prokinetic agent at night before bed, or they don't know that they should be on a prokinetic agent, or they don't know when the timing is. And then of course they need to be on one that actually works. You know, I've had people and even myself that have had taken so much ginger, they've got ginger burps and, you know, which could even trigger some reflux. And they're yeah. like, I, they're still not having improved motility or improved bowel function in the morning, you know? So, or some people will go to bed six months bloated and wake up maybe three months bloated, or they wake up still six months bloated and they can't get into their clothes and so those are these keynotes that say, okay, well, have you been tested for the skip in the record? Are you on, you know, have you looked for this bacterial overgrowth as far as what is causing the, the, the bloating, let's say, because a little transient bloating from a nice diverse salad is normal, folks. It's normal. <laughs> it just shouldn't be lingering and making us miserable and difficult to breathe and having some pain because de dependent on the person, a little bit of expansion can be extremely painful. It's called visceral hypersensitivity. Someone else can have that massive bloated belly and not feel the pain. They just feel the discomfort of being so distended. So that's the important piece that if, if they're having gut problems and they're having difficulty sleeping, Maybe they don't have the bloating or abdominal pain, but they do have liquid stool in the, and they've just been maybe self-treating, treating with over-the-counters. Imodium is pretty common. Um, and they'll just be like, oh, I've got that handled where, you, well, you've had, you have it band-aided. did. And there is still more to investigate. And that, that's what I'm passionate about is that even when I start working with somebody who's so focused on their, on their gut, I will, my number one question is how is your sleep? Because if they're having challenges with sleep, we're going to have a challenge with that migrating motor complex activation in the first place. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Is that sometimes a reason you think, um, when people wake up in the mornings and they're like, I'm not eating till like lunch, I'm not hungry. And I'm always like, that's a stress. Like to me, that's a red flag for stress, but it isn't it in the end. Yeah, your digestion didn't, your digestion never really kicked in. Like the stuff's actually sitting. Like it's not yeah. moving far enough for your body to have this. I've absorbed, I've mm -hmm. used, and I'm moving things out. And now there's space for more stuff. Absolutely. And, and then the intermittent fasting craze happened where they're like, Oh, well, since I'm not hungry and since coffee will last me until 2 PM, I am now intermittent fasting for X amount of hours. Aren't I gold stars, right? Jacking well, up my cortisol and <laughs> exactly. not helping my migrating like, motor oh, complex well, at all. Actually, I thankfully found an, a device that I was like, Oh, I am over fasting and it's stressing the system. So, um, quite frankly, it's actually a, another keynote that I'll hear from people. Are you hungry in the morning? No, no, I don't, I haven't eaten breakfast in years and it correlates with their stomach acid production. It can go both ways, but it's more so a high acid or a fast acid production. They're, they're very, and, and then it seems ironic, right? They're like, wait a minute, I have to too much stomach acid. Why isn't that burning through digesting my food faster? And that's the component where, again, I have this theory about methane because methane will cause retropulsion. It'll actually keep the stomach from emptying and it can actually push the stomach up into, you know, back up, which is referred to as a sliding hiatal hernia. And so again, there's there's to be continued there, I will say respectfully to our researchers that are out there working tirelessly on this. It's fascinating. So um, since you're doing a blood test, um, I'm just going to ask this um, and then we can finish that up. But what's your thought then on um, breath tests? Um, I think that they're very helpful. I think what can, but it's a snapshot. So I just recently had a follow-up person who's like, Oh, I had my breath test like, I don't know, two years ago. And I thought, 
oh, I, I, I actually was shocked that they thought that that was still valid. I don't know why, because they've been working with me for so long. And I said to her, I said, even if you had a breath test two days ago, it can be different now. So yeah, no, you need a new breath test. And it really does provide a roadmap. Um, historically, I used to be able, you know, I'd see what the gas levels were and I could forecast and I could predict. Now methane can be tricky because um, as you reduce that hydrogen, it's really clear once you've seen thousands of breath tests that hydrogen goes down and the methane can pop up. And so people will be frustrated by that and maybe even stop treatment because they're like, you didn't fix my methane. And I'm like, no, we're just getting started by reducing your hydrogen, the fuel source for methane. We're just now seeing the iceberg that was underneath. And now we can actually address that. I've also been able to show people by eating some carbs or not restricting their diet at all, that they can reduce their hydrogen in the small bowel because hydrogen is our friend in the large bowel, that they can have minimal bacteria in the small bowel and they can actually have the hydrogen levels shown in the large bowel and they feel that representation. They mm -hmm. feel right res resolution of symptoms and we don't need a stool test to look at all the individual people at the party. Um, so that, that is where I just say, oh, look, aren't you glad that you actually ate some rice and a little bit of bites of this and that? Because let's face it, those carbs can actually help turn people's brains on, you know, some people's thyroid, some people, yeah. I call it the dimmer switch. They've been restricted for so long that as soon as they have a bite of even potato, <gasps> a nightshade, yes. And their body lights up and they're just like, oh my gosh, like, thank you for giving me the permission, you know, to, to eat. Yeah. And what about, so, cause you were just saying like, we got to sleep to get to heal yes. the body. And I fully agree with you there. What are things that you um, help your patients with if they, if this is something that they struggle with with sleep? Definitely being on a proper prokinetic agent, um, looking at their epigenetics um, so we can individualize things so that they are, aren't are missing the ingredients that they need to then help facilitate not only the antimicrobial component. So for example, for myself, it was bile. Mm -hmm. um, methane can be treated with by bile or natural production of it. And I just had an enzymatic pathway that required me to have some support with nutrients that helped me produce more bile because once I would stop my treatment, um, my body just wasn't making enough bile. So there are, can be some very specific things for individuals that can just be game changing. And then quite frankly, because I know a lot of people, especially those listening to this podcast have probably been there, done a lot of things, but I would like to offer that there can be an energetic component and I'm outside of the energy of EMF and black and blue light and all of these things, it can actually be our own energies. Oftentimes it's just referred to as stress in capital letters and bold, but it's not addressed. It's not defined. It's not personalized to the person where we can actually get into their mind and brain and, and see that they're maybe the person that they're sleeping next to has an energy, you know, like there's something going on. I've also looked at um, the ways that people have their head positioned in their room. Um, I thought this was an interesting factor, but I did this with somebody with a child. And I was like, you know, they're going east to west with their head direction. Perhaps it would be better north to south. And they were just floored by like literally the next night, it, the, the child slept through the night and, and, you know, the sleeping problem was resolved. Or there's been electrical components right outside mm -hmm. the window, et cetera, right? So there are those energetic components, but then there's an individualized um, human beingness that also translates and can, you know, radiates energy. And that's what brought me into energy work. And for the longest time, I just thought, oh, well, is this validated, et cetera. And Interestingly, it is. There is quite a bit of work and studies uh, specifically on Reiki. Uh, they did quite a few studies during the pandemic. They even did distance energy healing and the results were really profound. And in fact, sleep was a big one that they noted, especially with healthcare workers during the pandemic, receiving this distance energy work. 
And so even I was like, oh, wow, okay, this is, it's like sometimes you see things clinically and then you back it up or you, you see that the evidence is there and then you offer it clinically. I always come from a very neutral place, but I just like to say, if you would like to have some energy work, just let me know. And I have really been impressed, but like in, in that sense of like how it has helped that individual, it has nothing to do with me. I'm just channeling the, the energy work for that person, but the profound changes that they have um, reported from that. So again, if it's like, I've been there, I've done everything, perhaps being open to energy work can also help some people. Awesome. If people want to learn more about that and more about you, where do they do that? How can they find it? <laughs> well, we have SIBOSolution.com and IntuitiveEdgeDoctor.com. And my platform, social media is Dr. Melanie underscore ND. Awesome. And I'll drop everything in the show notes as usual. And you do have a small gift for the audience as well. Yes, that's actually a micro meditation. I refer to it as it's only three minutes, but uh, again, it can, you know, if you think about the length of a song, which is around three minutes, it can adjust your attitude. Um, it can put you in the right space. It has biurnal beats. And so that can help facilitate the brain getting into a relaxed state, either in the evening or for sleep. Awesome. And I will drop the link for that below as well. Thank you so much, Melanie, for being here. It was Thank an you. absolute pleasure. I wish I had found you like seven, eight years ago when this whole disaster happened. Um, yeah. And everybody, if you know somebody who's struggling with this, if you feel that you're struggling with this, there is help. Um, there definitely is. Don't try a bajillion font maps and probiotics and everything by yourself. You're likely just going to make the journey a longer one. Um, just saying from my own experience and I think from what you've shared as well. Yeah. Um, so go give um, Dr. Keller a follow and then I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in the next episode. Thank you. Thank you.